Funding for Silver Spring Story of an American Suburb was provided by the Arts and Humanities Council of Montgomery County, the Montgomery County Historic Preservation Commission, the Maryland State Arts Council, Whole Foods Market, devoted to supporting organics and natural foods, the Silver Spring Women's Club, part of the community for more than 60 years, and Silver Spring Studios, delivering turnkey film and video production services, and by contributions from viewers like you. <laughs> At the dawn of a new century, an American suburb celebrates its rebirth. Silver Spring, Maryland is an unincorporated community just across the border from Washington, D.C. Its historic downtown is a scrappy survivor. Diverse, quirky, and decidedly unpretentious, it's gone from boom to bust and is coming back again. Silver Spring was really the quintessential American suburb. It was everything wonderful about what an American suburb should be. That was Main Street. This is where you hang out. This is where you had your coats and you had your Sundays and it was like it was like small town America. Well back then I think it was very friendly. It was very kid friendly or young person friendly. Yes, I used to ride my bike down there all the time with my, my friends. I knew all the cracks in the pavement. A lot of trees, a lot of uh, charming shops. Uh, it seemed to me it had every single thing you could want. Shopping. <laughs> Lots of shopping. Pet Company, Little Tavern, the Silver Theater, Han Shoes, J.C. Penney's. Seco Theater was just filled with kids. It was a kid's paradise. Giffords. Oh, the best Sundays in the world. The hot shop was fantastic. That was the meeting place. This is where all the kids would come, especially Friday night. God, those Mighty Mo's were good. So Silver Spring had it all, and I think it was together in such a way that we were all lucky that we lived here. In many ways, Silver Spring could almost be any place in America. But it has a character and a history all its own. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Jerry McCoy. I am the president of the Silver Spring Historical Society. I'd like to thank you for coming out today. Uh, to trace to the history of, of Silver, Silver Spring, Spring you have to start uh, here, at a small patch of green on East-West Highway. We're standing in front of the uh, remnants of the original Silver Spring. The community got its name from an actual spring that used to flow freely in this spot. The spring was officially discovered in 1840 by a rich and powerful member of the Washington elite, Francis Preston Blair. Blair was a newspaper publisher and political ally of President Andrew Jackson. In Blair's time, Montgomery County, Maryland was rural and sparsely populated. The name Silver Spring couldn't be found on any map. There was a small village called Sligo at the intersection of present-day Georgia Avenue and Colesville Road, but no Silver Spring. The area was resting in what one observer described as peaceful slumber. The area would be awakened from its slumber on a hot July day when Francis Preston Blair took a horseback ride from his home in Washington to escape the summer heat. The family legend has it that Blair and his daughter Elizabeth rode out from Washington together. Blair was looking for a place to build a summer home to escape the heat of the city. Elizabeth was busy reading a letter from her fiancé, Samuel Phillips Lee. The legend is that Elizabeth was concentrating on the letter and not paying attention to what was ahead of her, when a low-hanging branch swept her off the horse. 
that point, the horse became spooked and ran away. They found the horse drinking out of a spring that was bubbling up out of the ground. To Blair's delight, he sees that the spring sparkles like silver when the sunlight hits it because of mica flakes that were in the water. So he sees this beautiful spring, the surrounding countryside, and he and Elizabeth are absolutely enchanted. Blair decides right on the spot to buy the land surrounding the spring. This, he feels, would be the perfect place to build his country home, which he would call Silver Spring. Francis Preston Blair eventually bought a thousand acres, stretching from what is now 16th Street and Eastern Avenue all the way to Tacoma Park. He realized that Washington would be the capital, not just of the United States, but of the world. And this was going to be the center of everything. And to buy a thousand acres on the edge of it, if you could buy it at a very cheap price, was a damn smart thing to do. In 1845, Blair completed the summer home he'd always dreamed of, a mansion called Silver Spring. Oh, it was wonderful. It, it, it had a feeling of architecture that I like in the Victorian period uh, that was inspired by uh, the, quote, villa, country villa look. There were lots of French windows uh, and, and enclosed porches. Blair built his country estate into a working farm and eventually made Silver Spring his permanent residence. He enshrined his beloved spring with a nymph statue and next to it, he built what would later become a familiar symbol of Silver Spring, a distinctive acorn-shaped gazebo. So if you want to just take a walk inside and, and just peek up here. The Blair family history relates the story of how Francis Preston Blair proposed to his wife Eliza Gist under an oak tree. And to symbolize that momentous occasion and his love for Eliza, he built an acorn gazebo, which is still located in downtown Silver Spring in Acorn Park. The Blairs were one of the country's most powerful families, a true political dynasty. Elizabeth Blair would marry Admiral Samuel Phillips Lee, a cousin of General Robert E. Lee. His son, Montgomery Blair, became Postmaster General for President Lincoln. And Blair's grandson, Blair Lee, was a United States Senator. Presidents, including Abraham Lincoln, would visit the Silver Spring Mansion and sit on the front porch, sipping mint juleps and seeking sage advice from the Blairs and Lees. During its first two decades, Silver Spring remained a quiet, elegant country estate. The Civil War shattered the calm, and during the summer of 1864, peaceful little Silver Spring played a pivotal role. That summer, Confederate forces were marching toward a prized target, Washington, D.C. They would aim for Fort Stevens, a new fort in northwest Washington, a few miles from the Maryland line. The Confederate troops were under the command of General Jubal Early. Early's forces crossed the Potomac and marched through Frederick and Montgomery counties in the sweltering heat until they arrived in the village of Sligo, which is now downtown Silver Spring. They reached Silver Spring, uh, hoping to either that day or the next day to enter Washington from the north. Thirsty and hot, the Confederate troops helped themselves to the local liquor supplies. General Early and his officers congregated at the empty Silver Spring Mansion, and they too found liquid refreshment in Francis Preston Blair's bourbon cellar. And there were six big kegs the size of that sofa there uh, in the bottom of the corn house. They roll them out, and they got absolutely drunk. It didn't take the general long to figure out that his forces were in no shape to march into Washington. And instead of attacking that afternoon, they slept their alcohol off. It didn't attack till the next day. By the next morning, the Union had sent hundreds of reinforcements to Fort Stevens. When Early's troops finally attacked, they were no match for the assembled Union forces. The Confederates withdrew, and Washington was saved. 
As the Confederates retreated through Silver Spring, a Blair family home was mysteriously burned. The Falklands, country estate of Francis Preston Blair's son, Montgomery Blair, went up in flames. The Falklands mansion was quickly rebuilt, but to this day, no one's really sure who burned it down. For the next five decades, Silver Spring remained a quiet, rural community. Modern developments came slowly. In 1873, the Metropolitan Branch of the B&O Railroad opened a new route west, and Silver Spring was the first stop in Maryland. In 1878, the B&O completed construction of a Victorian rail station. The station stop was called Silver Spring, the first time that the community around Blair's property took on the name. The railroad shrank the distance between downtown Washington and Montgomery County and stimulated the growth of commuter suburbs like Tacoma Park, Garrett Park, Kensington, and Forest Glen. But it wasn't long before another revolutionary form of transportation gave Silver Spring a big push forward. In 1897, the Washington, Woodside, and Forest Glen streetcar line began running along what is now Georgia Avenue, from Forest Glen to the DC line. From there, passengers could connect to another line that would take them all the way downtown. It was now easier than ever to get from Silver Spring to Washington. By offering an alternate form of transportation for the commuter, the uh, electric streetcars did uh, create a market for people to want to move out into a suburban community. It was just really uh, an impetus to the, the future growth of downtown Silver Spring. In 1899, Francis Preston Blair's grandson, Gist Blair, founded the community's first post office, and Silver Spring was officially on the map. So with the creation of a Silver Spring post office, this really validated that this little, quiet community was now a force to be reckoned with, that it was recognized by the federal government as a real community, a community that was going to go nowhere but up in terms of its growth as a place to live. But at the turn of the century, Silver Spring was what Gist Blair called a crossroads without inhabitants. In 1910, there were only 4,500 residents of Silver Spring. But the progressive era that energized America brought progress to Silver Spring, too. As Model T's began to appear along Georgia Avenue, a small downtown business district began to take shape. In 1910, the Silver Spring National Bank, Silver Springs first, opened for business. In 1911, the community built its first armory, which is now the Silver Spring Volunteer Firehouse. Silver Spring was suddenly looking more like a Main Street community than a quiet farm town. The streetcar line crossed the railroad tracks at grade level, presenting a brand new roadway hazard. And streetcars and automobiles had to learn how to share the road the hard way. They didn't have enough automobiles on the road to know how to handle automobiles. An automobile would cut in front of a streetcar and he'd bang the bell and twirl the button and scream and holler and it was terrible. It scared the hell out of you. Helen Sherbert grew up in the 19 teens in this house on Georgia Avenue, right in the heart of downtown Silver Spring. That's her mother waiting to catch the streetcar to DC. Helen's father was one of the founders of the Silver Spring Volunteer Fire Department. By today's standards, Silver Spring's firefighting equipment was pretty rustic. Yeah, they had, had blankets over their heads and on their faces. And they had no protection, they had no hats. They had a water tank and they pulled the, they, they'd race with it, try to put the fire out. While women across the country were campaigning for the right to vote, Silver Springs women were grappling with a different problem. At night, the growing community was almost completely in the dark. I say it was pitch black in Silver Spring, except for, we call them pinpoint lights. You know, a light here and a light there. The Silver Spring Women's Improvement Society 
which later became the Silver Spring Woman's Club, installed four electric streetlights in the business district. To pay the electric bill, they went from house to house collecting money. They had to pay for the electricity. So when it began to get dark, they, somebody turned it on and then they were supposed to turn it off about 11 or 12 o'clock. And if any of these ladies looked out of their house and saw that light on after midnight, oh, they just had a fit. <laughs> Later, the Women's Improvement Society was partially responsible for the first sidewalks in downtown Silver Spring and helped to found the Silver Spring Public Library. They really had a community concern and I just felt that they were a little bit ahead of their times. Meanwhile, the Blairs and Lees, who had founded Silver Spring almost 80 years earlier, were about to give the community another big boost. And so was another development, thousands of miles away. World War I was raging in Europe, and in 1917, America entered the fighting. Communities across the country sent young men into battle, and Silver Spring was one of them. Colonel E. Brooke Lee, great-grandson of Francis Preston Blair and son of United States Senator Blair Lee, heard the call to battle. He helped to organize Company K of the Maryland National Guard. They drilled at the old Silver Spring Armory. And from there, it was a short march to the Silver Spring train station where they shipped off for war. E. Brook Lee Jr. remembers his father's iron resolve. He was a man of stature. When he grabbed you by the hand, his hand was like a big ham. I mean, you know, he grabbed a hold of you. When Colonel Lee and his fellow soldiers returned triumphantly from World War I, they seized an opportunity. World War I and the Progressive Era had transformed Washington into a major world capital. The city's population jumped by 100,000 in just one decade. And the size of the federal workforce doubled. All those new federal workers needed someplace to live. And Silver Spring was only a streetcar ride away. Hoping to build a bedroom community for a growing Washington, Colonel Lee and his associates founded the North Washington Realty Company. They bought up farmland and built some of Silver Spring's first real subdivisions. Almost overnight, the face of rural Silver Spring was transformed by a rush of new construction. The developers promoted Silver Spring as an idyllic alternative to life in the city. They even produced a promotional film to tempt city dwellers into the new suburban splendor. We encouraged people to come out here from Washington to live, which they did, and they all brought their sisters and their cousins and their aunts, and they, it built the town up in a hurry. Silver Spring was becoming the main bedroom community for federal workers in Washington. The most lush development was Woodside Park. Developed from the old noise farm just north of the business district, Woodside Park offered modern homes in beautiful wooded lots. Brochures and newspaper ads promised scenic beauty and a strong sense of community, with new houses starting at around $6,000. Woodside Park was Silver Spring's premier residential community, and even 75 years later, the Sylvan Park-like setting still resounds to this very day. But just as the developers were beginning to build up Silver Spring, Mother Nature reminded everyone who's boss. On April 5th, 1923, a tornado struck the heart of downtown Silver Spring. A handful of people were hurt and several houses were destroyed. Mary Margaret Dixon was inside her family home on Thayer Avenue and remembers the approaching storm. I was kneeling on the floor by the window seeing all this wind and all. And uh, it just sounded like a big truck roaring up the street. I heard this awful roaring, and I felt like the house shook. 
It just was horrible, the wind, the wind. And people were running down Georgia and there was blood all down their faces and holding their faces and screaming and hollering. One of the worst hit houses belonged to Dr. Dudley, co-owner of the Dudley and Kiefer Pharmacy. A nursemaid was rocking Dr. Dudley's infant daughter inside the house when the twister struck. She was on this room rocking the baby and she slid right out of the room, right down in that mess and didn't get a scratch. It was the worst tornado to strike downtown Silver Spring before or since. But even Mother Nature couldn't slow down Silver Spring with new housing booming and land values racing upwards, downtown Silver Spring took a giant leap forward. In one banner year, 1927, the business district underwent what one observer called the greatest rush of commercial development before or since. That year, Silver Spring got a new county office building. The National Institute of Dry Cleaning opened for business on Georgia Avenue in an unusual yellow brick building with a distinctive Spanish tile roof. And a new armory, looking a little like a medieval castle, went up on Wayne Avenue. They used to have roller skating in the new armory, and we'd all go up and roller skate there. It was, uh, it was quite an addition to Silver Spring. But it was the new Masonic Temple building at the corner of Wayne and Georgia Avenues that generated the most excitement. Standing all of four stories high, it was Silver Spring's tallest building, and the community welcomed it with great fanfare. And they had chairs and a band, and they had a bunning up, everything red, white, and blue. While the new buildings gave downtown Silver Spring a physical character, the residents gave it a soul. They were businessmen, shopkeepers, and government workers living a humble, middle-class American life. It was a very close community, and uh, you were able to roam around anywhere you wanted to in Silver Spring. Your parents never worried about where you were. Silver Spring's neighborly spirit was reflected in the mix of businesses along Georgia Avenue. National chains, like the Sanitary Grocery Company, stood side by side with quaint mom and pop shops. One of the residents' favorites was Hunter's Hardware. It had started at the turn of the century, selling feed, grain, and farm equipment. It truly was like, like a country store. You just couldn't leave this neat hardware store without buying something. There was something there that you had to have. Washboards canning equipment. Electric bulbs, I bought screwdrivers. Tools and screws and nuts and bolts. And if they didn't have it, you didn't need it or they didn't make it. It felt old, it smelled old, it had hardwood floors, old cash registers, and the salespeople in there, they were a charm unto themselves. We didn't greet them like customers. We greeted them like friends because they became friends. Just up the street from Hunter's Hardware stood the Seco Theater. Built in 1927, the Seco brought the movies to downtown Silver Spring. Seco was the place we loved to go on Saturday afternoon. Everybody went to the Seco. They had a woman in there who played the piano. We didn't have any sound. And when the horses were galloping, da, 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 you know, and when, when the horns were blowing, she had a thing that she blew, and you know. oh, it was a treat. We uh, used to go to the Seco Theater. Uh, I think I saw my first and probably only silent movie at, in the late 20s, City Lights with Charlie Chaplin. By the 1930s, Silver Springs children were flocking to the Seco every Saturday to catch up on the latest adventures of movie serial heroes, like Hopalong Cassidy. I don't like to see human beings getting tramped by a horse. Flash Gordon. Happy, you and Dale get back in there out of range. Hurry before they get through. And Charlie Chan. So the Seco Theater was just filled with kids. I mean, it was booing and jeering, and like you know, when, it, when uh, the bad guy was doing something. So it, it was a kid's paradise. 
downtown Silver Spring had become a quaint Main Street American community. But in just a few years, it would be transformed into one of Washington, D.C.'s premier suburbs. In the 1930s, while the country was in the grip of the Great Depression, downtown Silver Spring was holding its own. To look at the faces of these residents enjoying life on Thayer Avenue, you wouldn't think there was a depression going on at all. Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal brought thousands of new federal workers to Washington. The New Deal pumped economic life into Silver Spring because many of those federal workers chose to live in the downtown Silver Spring community. While other metropolitan areas lost population, Greater Washington continued to grow, and its scrappiest suburb continued to prosper. One sign that Silver Spring was coming into its own was the opening of a brand new post office building on Georgia Avenue in 1937. The Silver Spring Post Office, which had been housed in a variety of temporary locations since its founding four decades earlier, finally had a home. One of my best girlfriends that now live in Cal lives in California, Lucille Hendrick, she was Miss Silver Spring and she was in the parade for the opening of the Silver Spring Post Office. The new post office building featured a specially commissioned mural depicting what is now Silver Spring during the mid-19th century. Painted by Russian emigre Nikolai Tchaikovsky, the mural featured the old Eagle Tavern that stood at the corner of Georgia Avenue and Colesville Road, where the new Discovery Channel headquarters is today. Sixty years after its creation, the mural was recovered and restored, and now hangs in the Silver Spring Public Library. Imagine our excitement as a community to be able to rediscover the Silver Spring Post Office mural, to restore it, and to be able to return it to the community where it is enjoyed to this very day. In 1981, the post office moved to a new location. The original 1937 structure still stands on Georgia Avenue and is now a medical office. By the 1930s, the automobile was pushing downtown Silver Spring in new directions, like the streetcar and the railroad had done in earlier decades. An emerging car culture combusted with the energy of the New Deal to create a new kind of American architecture and Silver Spring was in the forefront. In 1938, developers built the Silver Spring Shopping Center at the corner of Georgia Avenue and Colesville Road on the site of an old apple orchard and beer garden. It was one of the first shopping centers built for customers arriving by car. It was the biggest, most successful example of a building type that broke all the established rules for selling goods. It gave up this priceless sidewalk frontage, pulled the whole building mass back, and gave over the front of the lot to a parking lot that had never been done before 1930. While the shopping center broke the rules, it also brought a new Art Deco elegance to Silver Spring and embodied the forward-looking spirit of the times. There's this tremendous emphasis on smooth lines, rounded contours, flow of rhythm, which was very powerful design symbolism during the 1930s, surging into a brighter tomorrow, smooth progress without the jagged ups and downs of the boom and bust cycle of the market. For the first time, residents could shop at stores like People's Drug, Kresge's, the A&P, a menswear store, and a bakery, all in one stop. For kids, they would stamp out donuts, and the, the dough that came out of that hole in the middle, they would fry that and give us the donut hole, that dough, free. But Silver Spring got more than a shopping center. The complex also included a new movie house, aptly named the Silver Theater. It was a beautiful theater, uh, the way it was made and set up inside and everything, the carpeting and the curtain and all. 
Keith Pierce was an usher at the Silver Theater in the 1940s. The theater, when we first, uh, when it first opened, was pretty sharp because of the silver. It had air conditioning. Uh, the sound system was through the building, and the uh, decorations were upscale for the area. I think of the Silver Theater as a very large part of my life because my grandmother took me there quite a bit, and I can remember seeing Gone with the Wind. In those days, you got cartoons and previews and newsreels and, and the movie, sometimes even double features. They had a double feature. It was the uh, Disney's Peter Pan and The King and I. And I just watched those two movies over and over and over again. We would just make this big grocery bag full of popcorn. And it was all greasy from the you know butter and everything. And just sit there and gorge ourselves on popcorn and watch movie after movie. Well, we would ride our bikes to the Silver Theater. And we would watch, you know, all kinds of shows. I saw The House of Wax there. I was so scared. And my sister was with me and she kept covering my eyes. And oh, it was just, they were, it was really great. After nearly five decades as a beloved movie house, the Silver Theater closed. The work is just phenomenal, the way things were, were once built here. Longtime residents were surprised to see how the theater had deteriorated. And even though there were only traces of the original Art Deco detail, the residents' memories of their favorite evenings at the Silver were as vivid as ever. Yeah, you were right about seeing Jaws down here. I got to think about it after you mentioned it, and we were sitting down there. The third row on the left side, and when the head popped up out of the yeah. boat, oh, okay. yeah, like that, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was kind of scary. Today, the Silver Theater is being renovated by the American Film Institute, giving new life to an old icon of Silver Spring. For all its newfound suburban convenience, downtown Silver Spring was not accessible to everyone. Real estate covenants kept African Americans and other minority groups from buying houses in Silver Spring proper. And the business district was, for the most part, segregated. Montgomery County's working black population carved out a separate life in nearby communities like Kengar and Linden. Charlotte Caulfield, grew up in the black community of Linden, just east of downtown Silver Spring. Many of the houses were not up to standard. In fact, uh, I don't think any of them had running water at that time, outdoor toilets, things like that. The community was very close-knit. Everybody knew everybody else, and it was like a big family. Everybody looked out for each other. Allison Claggett's family came to Montgomery County in the 1880s. If this little child over here did something wrong, some adult would let the parent know about that, and the parent would correct it. The only recreational activities we had were baseball games, and all the little communities had a team. Uh, our backyard was the playground for the area. We had um, the apple tree was the first base, and the peach tree was the second base. It was a, a sort of a neighborhood type thing. Everybody looked out after everybody else. For all the wholesomeness of life in Linden, it would be decades before African Americans had equal access to Silver Spring. In the years before World War II, Silver Spring was still more like a small town than a burgeoning suburb. In the 1940s, we used to call it sleepy old Silver Spring, because indeed it was. Uh, at nighttime, you wouldn't see anything, no cars. George Avenue was a two-lane road north of Silver Spring until the 1950s. When you walked in to, on the streets of Silver Spring, you generally knew somebody. It, very rarely you didn't run across somebody that you didn't know. Uh, you, in the stores, you knew who the merchants were, and they, they knew who you were. We didn't have television. We didn't have malls to go to with video games. So what we would do, we, we'd organize and do things. We'd ride bikes or we'd have baseball games in the middle of the street. I think I was uh, probably 16 at the time. But anyhow, I played on the American Legion baseball team. And the fathers challenged us to a father-son game. We thought, ha, 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 we can beat these old men because in those days, 
when you were over 30, you were dead as far as kids were concerned. Uh, but when we showed up at Montgomery Blair baseball field, they had recruited Walter Johnson, who's in the Hall of Fame. They had recruited Jack Bentley, who pitched for the New York Giants against the Washington Senators in 1924. And they recruited Joe Judge, who was a first baseman for the Washington pennant winning team in 1933. And I had the honor of catching Walter Johnson when he was warming up to pitch, and that I'll treasure all my life. Joseph Blair Park was a wonderful park in my childhood. We went there for family picnics. I was always inspired and amazed by the very large trees. Uh, the Joseph Blair House was the home of the library when I was a child. There were these old, musty smelling wooden floors that creaked. And I would wander around with my mother and we'd find some wonderful books. That's one of my first vivid memories, those wooden floorboards, that big old house, and books. My friends and I would generally go to Silver Spring on bicycle, uh, and usually the, the destination was either Kresge's or Murphy's, which was the five and ten cent store. And of course the big attraction in there were the comic books that we could buy, which my father hated me buying, but we bought them anyway. And also they started selling 45 RPM records in there when they first started coming out, which was a big deal. Then we come back up by the Little Tavern and usually get a hamburger. The Little Tavern was neat. It was the first place we could ever buy hamburgers at five cents a piece. And so uh, sometimes we would make a, a dinner out of coming down and getting 25 or 30 hamburgers and taking them home. As America's teen culture took shape in the 1940s, Silver Springs teens had their own favorite pastimes. The uh, National Guard Army at uh, down on Wayne Avenue was a uh, collecting place for what they called the teen club. Friday and Saturday nights, they would always have uh, either records or maybe a small band come in, so there was a dance uh, on weekends. It was just a big room with a hardwood floor like a gym. And uh, there, there's a stage, and the desk jockey and the band would be up on the stage. When we go to a teen event, the uh, music most always was big band. It was what they refer to now as swing. It, the swing dance now is the same thing we used to do called the Lindy or the Jitterbug. The Silver Theater also became a teen hangout, especially when a certain blue-eyed singer lit up the screen. When the Frank Sinatra shows would come on, the girls would come in and stay all day with their lunch, bobby socks, poodle skirts, and what have you, and there was no way to get rid of them until uh, the theater closed at 11 o'clock, and they just sat there and screaming and squealing. For a grown-up evening out, there was nothing like the elegance of Mrs. K's Toll House. The restaurant, which is still in business in the same location today, actually did start as a toll house in the early 1900s. During Prohibition, it was a roadhouse where singer Kate Smith performed. In 1930, the property was purchased by the Kreuzberg family and opened as a restaurant. In the old days, it was a delight to go to Mrs. K's. We used to wait to see her Christmas decorations. And the place always had flowers on the table. We had tablecloths, we had crystal, we had china. Mrs. K's elegant decor and top-notch service lured some powerful patrons into Silver Spring. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt would drive herself all the way from the White House for one of Mrs. K's meals. Mrs. Roosevelt may have come to Silver Spring for a satisfying meal, but during the 1940s, it was downtown D.C. that was really cooking. Rick Nelson would ride the streetcar downtown. I was interested in transit because it always meant when I got on I was going somewhere which was exciting. I was either going to my grandmother's, I was going to the amusement park, I was going to the movies. So I always associated getting on a streetcar or getting on a bus with something good. There was a limited amount of things you could buy in Silver Spring, so you were forced to go downtown to D.C. to the big department stores on F and G Street which was an all-day deal. It was a pretty big deal. Yeah, we used to go down to ball games, baseball games, go to Griffith Stadium, that was always a big deal. Uh, they had great uh, uh, 
live shows at the theaters downtown, the Capitol and the Palace, and so that was always exciting. In 1941, Washington, D.C. was about to become one of the most important cities in the world, and life was about to change for everyone. As America entered World War II, sleepy old Silver Spring became an important suburb to a wartime capital. During World War II in Silver Spring, we had regular air raid drills, and most places in the country had those anyway. So an air raid drill at nighttime would be a blackout. All lights had to be out. The siren would blow. The siren was on top of the fire station at George Avenue and Silver Spring Avenue, where the station is today. Mom would come in, turn all the lights out. I was scared to death, absolutely scared, petrified. Food was rationed. No sugar, no butter, no gasoline to speak of. The main gas station was at Colesville in Georgia. It was Barrett's Esso. And the line would come up Colesville Road. It would be a two-block line when they had gas. Nellie Hewitt Stinchcomb remembers her father, Captain Frank Hewitt, of the Maryland National Guard, reviewing the troops at the Silver Spring Armory, including all four of her brothers. Well, Daddy went down just to inspect them uh, during the drill, and uh, I took a picture. I remember uh, inspecting the boys because it was unusual to have the four boys in one company. New recruits would often ship out from the Silver Spring train station. And thanks to an extraordinary personal gesture, Silver Spring servicemen always knew the community was thinking of them. Russell Mizell of the Mizell Lumberyard would hand out a $1 bill to each departing serviceman. It started in 1941 when he took one of his sons over to the train station here in Silver Spring. He looked around and saw maybe 20 or 30 that were leaving that day on the train, and he wondered to himself, I wonder how many of these kids are leaving today without a cent in their pocket. And he gave out $41 bills that day. From then on, Mr. Mizell made sure each departing serviceman had a dollar in his pocket, a tradition that lasted through the Korean War. Some of the guys used it, spent it, like for cigarettes or whatever. Uh, I kept mine. I had no idea that anyone would do anything like that to, to a, a bunch of guys just going off to go into the Army. Silver Spring students did their part for the war effort as members of the Blair High School Victory Corps. In the Victory Corps, high schoolers were trained to fill civilian jobs left vacant by the war. I was working as a junior draftsman, uh, ultimately to take the place of the draftsmen that were going to go into service, and then two of them uh, actually went into service, and I think both of those went in the Air Corps and were killed. I think it made, made us feel like we were contributing something, even though we weren't contributing anything militarily, it made us feel like we were, we were doing something, if nothing more than symbolic, that showed that we were interested and wanted to do something about the war. Hundreds of Silver Spring residents went off to war. Some of them came home to the old b &O station in caskets. Others returned on Red Cross trains. I can remember during the war, I don't know how anybody found out about it, but troop trains would come in and take the wounded soldiers down to Walter Reed, and they would bring these troops in that they were wounded. I mean, God, oh, geez, you know, they had bandages everywhere, and there were nurses and doctors. Uh, ambulances were lined up down George Avenue to pull in and pick them up. And as I remember, it was very quiet, very quiet. Just up Georgia Avenue, scientists worked in secret on a new weapon of war at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. The lab occupied the site of the old Wolf Motor Company on Georgia Avenue and everyday residents could only wonder what was going on inside. There were guards there that were armed, and there was a gate, and we knew it was a secret place, and that was the end of that. Helen Sherbert worked at the Applied Physics Lab during the war and for several decades after. We still had to sign up on the side, use cars, the whole time I worked there. I was in personnel. 
and uh, we were not allowed to discuss it or anything. We were trying to keep this thing a secret. After several years of research, the lab scientists developed a new weapon to boost Allied firepower. It was called the Proximity Fuse. The Proximity, or Variable Time Fuse, has exploded every time at the most effective distance from the target. With the development of the Proximity Fuse, Silver Spring, in its own humble way, had helped to turn the tide of the war. When World War II ended in 1945, Silver Spring, like the rest of America, rejoiced. And like other American cities and suburbs, Silver Spring was about to experience a post-war prosperity of historic proportions. In 1945, the same year that World War II ended, Silver Spring got a brand new train station. The B&O Railroad built a modern colonial revival structure to replace the Victorian station that had served the public for nearly 70 years. Betty Fowler, the daughter of longtime station master Russell Maine, lived on the second floor of the old Victorian station with her family. It was the heartbeat in my mind of uh, Silver Spring. It was the main hub. That was, that was Silver Spring to me. The B&O station was Silver Spring. One of the first memories I have living in Silver Spring was hearing the train whistle. And even today, every time I hear that whistle, um, it brings back all the wonderful old memories. At mid-century, railroading was still America's favorite form of intercity transportation. Sleek passenger trains like the Capital Limited from Washington to Chicago now made regular stops in Silver Spring. I recall the fact that we, we thought it was hot stuff that all these through trains stopped in Silver Spring. I mean, you know, the Capital Limited at night was stopped there and the other trains. And that was, a, that was a pretty big feather in our cap. Silver Spring was an important stop on the B&O line. And with the District of Columbia only a few blocks away, some Washingtonians preferred the convenience of the Silver Spring Station to Union Station downtown. Even presidents of the United States appreciated the easy access and lower profile that the Silver Spring Station offered. During the war, President Franklin D. Roosevelt boarded a train from Silver Spring for a secret trip west to inspect the nation's military facilities. President Harry Truman sent his wife and daughter on train trips home to Missouri from the Silver Spring Station and met them on their return. I never met President Truman myself, but I've been told that when they stopped at Silver Spring, he would come over and talk with my father, and the first time he met my father, he shook his hand and thanked him for his uh, dedication during the war. When General Dwight Eisenhower was running for president in 1952, he made sure to make a whistle stop at the Silver Spring Station. We learned that the Eisenhower Special was going to stop at Silver Spring. It was headed towards Washington. And he gave a speech off the back of the platform. He met the test triumphantly. And my mother drove me down there. We parked, I remember still, we parked in front of the International Harvester dealer. And the crowd just looked so respectable. Even now, I remember the men wearing their hats and the women wearing their fur their coats with fur uh, trim. You know, I thought that was something, you know, I mean, here, because most of those presidential trains would come through here and not stop. In the 1980s, the Silver Spring Station fell into disrepair and later closed. The few remaining passenger trains from Washington to Chicago didn't stop at Silver Spring anymore. But in 2002, the station building was restored and reopened as a reminder of Silver Springs railroading past. Boomtown, D.C. Boomtown, a factory city where there is only one purpose, industry, and only one industry, government. Fresh from victory in World War II, Greater Washington was booming. The wartime government had swelled the size of the federal workforce. America's World War II veterans were coming home to start new lives. The baby boom was about to begin. 
and Silver Spring was becoming one of America's fastest growing suburbs. So after the war, the shot in the arm became people moving in, building new houses. Enormous amount of, of building went on. Just an enormous amount of subdivisions were built around here. That gave the shot in the arm because there was more people here, just a lot more people. In my mind, I see all these small but well-built little brick ramblers and two-story brick houses. There was a sense of community. It was tidy. It was solid and respectable. Brimming with post-war confidence, developers saw an opportunity to build Silver Spring into a retail center for the entire region. That and the growing popularity of automobiles shifted downtown Silver Spring into high gear. Yeah, Silver Spring was a very innocent place, uh, especially during the 50s when I was raised up here. Uh, you can go anywhere you want, the movie theaters, shopping, heck company. Uh, you can go to Han Shoes, J.C. Penney's. There's so many places to go and it was like, it was very safe. You could walk around, walk back home, take the bus. Post-war prosperity transformed Silver Spring into a suburban shopper's paradise. Before the war, shoppers had to go to downtown Washington for a real department store. But in 1947, the Hecht Company built its first suburban location in downtown Silver Spring. The neatest thing about the Heck Company is when they were building it, it was an enormous hole in the ground. When Hex opened, that became the tallest building in Silver Spring. The Masonic Hall was before that. That was three stories. Hex was taller. It was air conditioned. It had elevators and escalators in it, and we thought we had died and gone to heaven. Almost overnight, shoppers from all over the metropolitan area flocked to Silver Spring. Within a few years, other stores followed the Hecht Company's lead. J.C. Penney's, Jellix, and Hans Shoe Store all opened Silver Spring locations. With all those stores and plenty of parking, Silver Spring was the customer's choice. Shopping. <laughs> Lots of shopping because they had real nice stores there. It was the place to be. So Silver Spring had it all, and I think it was together in such a way that we were all lucky that we lived here. One of the community's most famous residents relished the shops and restaurants of post-war Silver Spring. And there was Han Shoe Store on the corner, and the Han Shoe Store was spelled H-A-H-N, but somehow I took some kind of pride in that. And then my father had a watch shop in, uh, on George Avenue, and that was the Han's watch shop. So, you know, we were like little celebrities anyway, because Daddy was, you know, the great watch repairer. Another Silver Spring celebrity, best-selling author Nora Roberts, says downtown Silver Spring was a teenage girl's dream. We used to run around in packs and nobody was upset, and I'm sure that we were obnoxious from time to time. But I don't remember anybody ever having to yell at us to tell us, you know, get out or you're banned from the store, and that sort of thing. Or you could go into the record store and you could go into the shoe store and to Murphy's and that sort of thing and, and into People's and, and they were used to seeing you. In the middle of it all was the Silver Spring Shopping Center with People's Drug Store right on the corner. People's was kind of neat. They had a smell in there that, that you can't, it wasn't objectionable, but it was a, a, a drugstore smell that was all its own. You, know, you could wear a blindfold and walk in there and know you were in People's. I, don't ask me why or how, but the soda fountain, that was always kind of neat. You got, you know, real food and real sodas and everything. Uh, that was the place to go. As the downtown Silver Spring shopping district grew, so did traffic on Georgia Avenue. In 1948, Silver Spring got a new underpass for Georgia Avenue at the B&O Railroad Crossing. What might seem like a simple steel and concrete structure was a powerful symbol of post-war progress for Silver Spring. Oh, I thought it was beautiful. Man, all this concrete and steps and lights and everything, I thought it was beautiful. And especially to stand up top and watch the cars go by. That was big time to a kid like me. 70,000 people turned out for a parade and a ribbon cutting. By mid-century, Silver Spring was Washington's most populous suburb. 
Chamber of Commerce people were touting Silver Spring as the second great city of Maryland after Baltimore. And it was because of this dynamic, rapidly growing downtown commercial district. Downtown Silver Springs boosters celebrated their success with annual holiday parades. There were floats, there were majorettes, there were bands. It was a beautiful thing. It was a long parade, a very long parade. Yeah, it would take quite a, about an hour, hour and a half probably to get through. Very big. Everyone from beauty queens to everyday residents participated. One year we had this Snoopy float and Snoopy was very high up on the float and unfortunately too high. So we had to have a couple of men get up there and lay it flat while we went underneath the underpass so we could continue on our way. I know we won a first place that year though. <laughs> but no one could throw a parade quite like Montgomery Blair High School. Well, the Blair homecoming plays were big, they were huge. So it was a long parade. It was kind of neat. They had floats and the kids would be driving their parents' cars and the convertibles. You had the homecoming queen and the homecoming king. It was craziness. Everybody had their uh, white and blue streamers on their cars, blowing their horns, shoe polish saying, go Blair, Blairites. Built in 1935, Blair was the only high school in the heart of downtown Silver Spring. As the post-war population grew, so did Blair's student body. I think Montgomery Blair has um, a very big part of the history of Silver Spring. I can remember them telling us that when they built it, they said, where are you going to find 500 kids to put in this building? Well, of course, over the years, they had to add building after building after building, and it seems to me it was like 2,100 total student body when I was there. Blair turned out more than its share of star students. Actress Goldie Hawn, journalists Carl Bernstein and Connie Chung, best-selling author Nora Roberts, sportscaster Chick Hernandez, national public radio correspondent Daniel Zwerdlin, and author, actor, and TV personality Ben Stein. I don't think the importance of Blair can be possibly expressed adequately because it was the core of the community. When the when big games happened, the whole town would turn out for it. When Blair won championships, the whole town would turn out for the victory parade. Blair says Silver Spring to me. That's what it says. You, you can't say one without the other. When I'm out, even across the country, I promise you, when you mention Silver Spring, invariably the question is, where did you, did you go to Blair High School? Blair was the in-school. That was like the college campus in those days. Very good students, very good athletic teams, wonderful feeling. It was like a club, but everyone in the high school was in the club. It just makes, it makes me cry even when I think of it, you know. It's been 40 years since I graduated from Blair, and when my father died in 99, people from Blair were more sympathetic by far than the people I'd gone to college or law school with. As downtown Silver Spring prospered, the sleepy small town life of earlier years gave way to a suburban existence that now seems like something out of a movie. Grab that special one and jump into your candy-colored custom or your screaming machine, cruise downtown and catch American Graffiti. When I saw American Graffiti, I said, this is Silver Spring. This is what it's all about. I mean, there were drag strips. We'd drag in the main drag, of course. Uh, you'd stop and have your food, meet all your friends, kibitz, and then try to pick up girls. The Hot Shops restaurant on Georgia Avenue was the focal point of many fond Silver Spring memories. The Hot Shop was fantastic. That was the meeting place. This is where all the kids would come, especially Friday night. Um, uh, there'd be a bonfire at the school. And we had lap, it was called lapping the shops. You just drive around the shop, hot shop, over and over again. So you're in a car, you're on a date, and you would just drive around and around, you just make the circuit. And then they had the clip-on speaker system. You, you'd talk into the microphone and you'd order your item, and then some pretty young girl would come out and she'd hook it onto your window. you go inside to eat, which wasn't real cool, and they would put you with the kids on one side and, and then the uh, adults ate on the other. Oh, the orange freezes, my favorite. I go. Oh, I wish they still made them. 
God, those Mighty Moe's were good. I think if I could choose one food as a single favorite food, it would be the Mighty Moe. A favorite gathering spot for young and old was the Tasty Diner. Located at the corner of Wayne and Georgia, the Tasty was a typical railroad car style diner. It was open round the clock and served as a late night refuge for Silver Spring residents. There was just always something to look at when you sat in a booth at Tasty Diner and um, stared out those plate glass windows and just watched the world go by while you were sipping a cup of coffee. My dad's shop used to have a window that looked into the window of the Tasty Diner and I'd go over there and get ice cream and stuff like that after school. My father would take my mother and myself to the Tasty Diner for dinner and I'd always order either a hot roast beef sandwich or a hot turkey sandwich. In later years when my husband and I were dating and went to dances and all, we informal wear end up back at the Tasty Diner. So it was a part of my life for a lot of years. So I guess it's just after more than 60 years in business on Georgia Avenue, the Tasty had to be moved to make way for the new Discovery Channel headquarters. In July of 2000, longtime customers enjoyed one last breakfast at the old Tasty Diner. Yeah, I wanted to come have one last meal in the real location of the Tasty Diner. We'll be moving and taking this cab it will stay with us, it will become our lobby, entranceway, and will look much like it has since 1935. A few days later, the Tasty Diner was hitched to a truck and gingerly moved up Georgia Avenue to its new home on Cameron Street. Another unpretentious but popular dining spot was Crisfield Seafood Restaurant, which is still in business today on Georgia Avenue, more than half a century later. When I walk into Crisfields today, it's like walking to Crisfields back in 1954. Nothing has changed. It's kind of art deco, seafood family style diner, if that makes any sense at all. Well, at Chris Fields, I really just enjoy their crab cakes as well as crabs. That's one of my favorite seafood dishes. I was a big shrimp guy at Chris Fields. I always had to have my, my steamed shrimp. I like the, the crab cakes first. <laughs> and for dessert, there was nothing like Gifford's ice cream. Gifford's? Oh, the best sundaes in the world. Giffords was like the best place to go for the best ice cream. It was not fancy at all. It sits you down. Service was terrible. Uh, all the water was, was served to you in, in blue plastic glasses. You hope they were clean. But the ice cream was fantastic. The fudge was fantastic. And you, get a, you had to get a banana split. If you didn't get a banana split, why go to Giffords? The Silver Spring location of Giffords closed in the 1980s. But Giffords' sister location in Bethesda lives on in a brand new store a tribute to the sweet memories of life in post-war America. Before the 1960s, Silver Spring was a predominantly white suburb. African Americans who worked in Silver Spring lived in nearby black communities. Segregation wasn't as severe as in the Deep South, but the boundaries were understood. Downtown Silver Spring was just about like it was in, in Rockville. You, you, it was segregated. The theaters, you would go there, you had to go on the balcony, you couldn't sit with uh, the general audience. We couldn't go into restaurants, for example. Uh, going into dress shops, we were, you know, watched very closely. We couldn't try on clothing. If you tried it on, you better take it out. We couldn't try on a hat or a dress. Whatever you tried on, you would have to take it. When I got old enough to go to a movie, go to a theater, I would go to the theaters in the district. And I could sit where I wanted to. We wanted to go out to dinner. We couldn't go to d out to dinner to Silver Spring. We had to go to Washington, D.C. When Montgomery County schools were integrated in the 1950s, downtown businesses soon followed. After school integration, that's when it, the big change came. 
I went to Hex, I went to Penny's, and the people treated you just like they treated everybody else. As society was beginning to change, several landmarks of the old Silver Spring were beginning to disappear. In 1954, Francis Preston Blair's Silver Spring Mansion was demolished to make way for a new postal facility. I saw it the day after, and it was a, a large pile of rubble, bricks, and debris, uh, feeling a mixture of sadness and anger that something that I had learned to respect as being the most important house in Silver Spring with a fascinating history had been destroyed. Then, nearly 100 years after it first burned in the Civil War, Montgomery Blair's Falkland estate went up in flames again. But this time, it was in the name of progress. Phyllis Capellman actually lived on the grounds of the old estate. We lived in a little red wooden house down the hill from it as part of the property, which was the cook's house. And when it snowed, you could start at the top of the hill and go flying down past our house and kind of land on the edge of the woods in the backyard. In 1958, the Falklands was burned to make way for the new Blair Shopping Center and apartment complex. Rick Nelson was a volunteer with the Silver Spring Fire Department. That was uh, an arrangement where the contractor would let the fire department burn that building down to, to practice on if they would let it go all the way. It was really a tender box. It was an old building. The, the wood was very old in that. And it I remember the crackling sound that came off of that particularly. But we ha did it a lot because there was a lot of houses sitting on commercial property in Silver Spring all of a sudden. And they, they just they gave way to the commercial demands. That's all there is to it. They had to. It was very hard to watch them burn down Falkland Manor because it had, we'd lived there for 14 years and it had a lot of memories. While some mourned the loss of the Falklands, the Blair Shopping Center and Apartment Complex became one of Silver Spring's first modern high-rise developments and the site of one of the community's first big supermarkets. With the old rapidly disappearing to make way for the new, Silver Spring began to develop a more urban skyline. In the mid-60s, the World Building became the tallest in Silver Spring. And atop the World Building was a studio and transmitter for WGAY Radio. WGAY, the radio station, couldn't wait to move into it and put their tower on top. And that was interesting to watch that being lifted up on top and put in there, but it was became a very big building for Silver Spring. But by the mid-60s, the seeds of downtown Silver Spring's demise were already planted. The suburb that helped invent the modern shopping center was about to be eclipsed by a new kind of retail development, the shopping mall. And one of Montgomery County's very first shopping malls was Wheaton Plaza. With scores of new stores and acres of parking, Wheaton Plaza was the new shopper's paradise. I would say Wheaton Plaza sucked the commercial life out of Silver Spring. When that place opened up, that changed the whole ball game in terms of how people shopped. There wasn't a lot anymore in Silver Spring in terms of you had to go park, you had to find a place to walk around, you'd have to walk here and there. Nothing was really close to each other. But Wheaton Plaza, everything was just right there for you. When the Capitol Beltway was completed in 1964, it not only allowed motorists to circle the city at high speeds, it sped up the growth of outlying suburbs and new shopping malls. And that meant less business for downtown Silver Spring. By the 1980s, the middle class simply wasn't shopping in downtown Silver Spring anymore. One by one, the major retailers like Hecht's and Penny's closed up and left. The old Silver Spring Shopping Center, once a model for the future, was now a relic of the past. I remember driving down George Avenue uh, with my kids and, and looking around and I thought things are boarded up, pasted up, stores are out of business right now. Uh, why come to Silver Spring? There's nothing in the Silver Spring to come to anymore. When you drive through, you see litter and trash and empty lots and stores boarded up, and it was a very depressing feeling. I was feeling very sad because it looked like a ghost town. 
It was almost like all my memories were just sort of sitting there on a stoop. After years of neglect, business leaders, developers, and politicians agreed downtown Silver Spring was in dire need of a facelift. Downtown Silver Spring was perceived as dead or dying, and the older buildings were, were regarded by a great many people as, if not the problem, one of the major problems holding back uh, the future of Silver Spring. But not everyone agreed on how to rebuild. And by the mid-1980s, Silver Spring was engulfed in a full-scale preservation war. The reason this Battle of Silver Spring was so powerful and vicious is that it did set neighbor against neighbor. There would be neighbors that wanted to tear everything down and start over from new, and people right next door saying, no, we got to preserve some of it and then build new. We believe that the buildings should be saved. We believe that they had sufficient historic significance to justify preservation. We believe that if they were restored and treated well and marketed intelligently, they could become tremendous assets. Places with emotional memories for so many residents were in danger of being lost forever. And the Silver Spring Shopping Center and Silver Theater were on the front lines. There were workers destroying the Silver Theater and Shopping Center. They were out there with equipment ripping everything down. They ripped down the Silver Theater marquee sign. They ripped down the big Art Deco chimney. All of this Art Deco detail was ripped out and destroyed because they knew that if this were substantially destroyed, it may not be designated as historic at the upcoming public hearing. In the end, the Silver Theater and Shopping Center were saved but the beloved Silver Spring Armory was ultimately in the way of progress. And in 1999, it was demolished. I think at that point, the residents of Silver Spring were so desperate for revitalization of the downtown Silver Spring business district that if it was going to come at the cost of the demolition of the Silver Spring Armory, they were willing to make that sacrifice. But there were other controversies. Ambitious proposals for rebuilding downtown Silver Spring went down in flames. None was more controversial than the American Dream, a proposed mega mall by the developers of the Mall of America in Minneapolis. The two million square foot design included shopping, an ice skating rink, and a water park. Having visited the Mall of America in Minneapolis, I cannot for one second imagine such a thing on the corner of Georgia Avenue and Colesville Road. The reason none of these proposals worked in the end is that they were all so big that it seemed to take over the downtown, the heart of the downtown, and this unnerved an awful lot of people. For years, no one knew what to do with downtown Silver Spring. As in other Washington area suburbs, the arrival of Metro in 1978 changed the face of Silver Spring in what seemed like an instant. We were excited when the Metro came in because uh, it, it was a new thing for, for all of us. Just to see that huge Metro structure there and all the buses coming and going, and it just seemed like this is a city that's taking off. It opened up Silver Spring to a lot of people who otherwise would not have come to Silver Spring. To make way for the new construction around Metro, Older commercial buildings were demolished, and sparkling new office towers shot up in their place. When Metro opened in February 1978, it was planned that when that day came, that there would be large-scale development clustered around the Metro station. After the Metro opened up, uh, buildings uh, zoomed up into the air, skyscrapers that we never had before in Silver Spring. But the old downtown would have to wait a couple of decades to catch up to the development around Metro. In the 1970s, downtown Silver Spring was discovered by a new generation of kids. Downtown stores, restaurants, and big buildings were only a bike ride away. For kids, the small scale of downtown Silver Spring made for a big city adventure. It was sort of a, a town center community. It was self-contained. It had all of the things that you, that you needed. It was carefree, um, 
so it, it is nostalgic. In fact, the freedom of a day out in downtown Silver Spring tempted some kids to test authority and experiment with petty crime. When I was a teenager in the early 70s, I used to shoplift at the Heck Company. So I went in there and I took something. I think it was a candle or something. And, and I got spotted and I was chased through the store by security guards and I, I made it, you know, I made it out of there. Of course, you never really make it because I got busted a couple years later in another store and, and that was the end of my career. Novelist George Pelicanos still lives in downtown Silver Spring. He remembers the earthier side of Silver Spring in the 70s. The garages, specialty shops and bars to the south of the main shopping district. He locked the front door of the shop and checked it, then walked up Bonifant Street toward George Avenue. In his detective novel, Right as Rain, Pelicanos pays tribute to the streets of Silver Spring. He passed an African in a Thai restaurant and one each of many braid and nail and dry cleaning storefronts that low rise the downtown business district of Silver Spring. He crossed the street before reaching the quarry house, one of two or three neighborhood bars he frequented. It doesn't feel like a suburb to me, it feels like it's part of the city. I mean, I'm a, I'm a city freak, so um, other people might like mountains or lakes or whatever, and I just like looking at cities at night. I think it's kind of it's got its own beauty to it. How you doing? Take it easy. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Probably no one symbolized Silver Springs' earthier side better than its honorary mayor, Norman Lane. He's a homeless guy that hung around Silver Spring. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. He knew all the merchants. Lord, the merchants would give him their morning, de the deposits in the morning to take up to the bank. Now here's a guy who liked to, you know, tip a bottle now and then, and they're giving him the, the whole receipts from the day before to take up there. But he'd go up and come back. Silver Spring's local celebrity gained national stature when he was featured on the TV show, Real People. In the little town of Silver Spring, Maryland, has a problem with the town mayor and the town drunk. Ah. The town mayor doesn't get along with the town drunk. The town mayor is the town drunk. I think it was an inside joke for the community to refer to him as the mayor because Silver Spring was and to this day remains unincorporated and this was probably the closest we were ever going to get to having a mayor. Lane died in 1987, but he's been honored like a real mayor with a statue in a little alleyway off Georgia Avenue. In the late 60s, what was once an all-white suburb was becoming more diverse. Civil rights and fair housing legislation had opened up the suburbs to African Americans. And after the social upheaval in America's major cities during the 1960s, city dwellers of all ethnicities were fleeing for the safety of the suburbs. Fred Samuel's family arrived in 1968. Silver Spring was certainly was one of the places that we felt accepted. There was a larger African American population in Silver Spring than in many other parts of the county. Uh, so that was one of the things that, that, that made it uh, warm for us. Uh, very Leave It to Beaver. The people knew each other. They were friendly to each other. Uh, our next door neighbor, Maud, uh, made cookies. And she would come over and she would say, I made cookies. Would you like some? In the 1980s and 90s, Silver Spring welcomed a new wave of immigrants from Latin America, Asia, and Africa. Ethnic restaurants and specialty shops brought an international flavor to downtown Silver Spring, and the community celebrated its diversity. People think of international, they think of New York, or they think of Los Angeles. But I think what people fail to realize is just how international this city is and how accepting it is of people of other cultures and other nationalities. I really think Silver Spring had a lot to do with my success. Um, I traveled across the world when I was a young girl in the sport of gymnastics and I got to see other areas and they did not have what Silver Spring had to offer in the sense of diversity and the wonderful representation of different cultures. You really have to live with, with someone to, under, to understand them, I think. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about Silver Spring. Right, this will be the AFI's new screening rooms and a large glass gallery in between the old and the new theaters. 
It took a few years, but by the late 90s, the community, the county, and the developers finally had a plan for revitalizing downtown Silver Spring that almost everyone could agree on. The exciting thing about the current project being built in downtown Silver Spring is it has all the uses we were looking for, but it fits into the fabric of the city much better than all the failed proposals ever did. This will be the larger screening room. We'll have 200 seats, and then this one will have 80 seats. So this is going to be uh, absolutely state-of-the-art. The Silver Theater would be leased to the American Film Institute, expanded and restored. The Silver Spring Shopping Center, which preservationists fought so hard to save, would be restored and reclaim its place at the core of downtown Silver Spring. Part of constructing the new here in downtown Silver Spring is preserving the past. It's going to serve as a reminder to us all that the best of the past can also be the best of the future. The tasty diner would be moved to its new home on Cameron Street after 4,000 residents petitioned to save it. The Discovery Channel would erect a brand new headquarters building on Georgia Avenue. Exciting new stores and restaurants, including some prominent national chains, would open for business. I want to welcome you all to another red letter day in Silver Spring as we mark the final phase of retail construction. Right here on the spot will be built a Pier 1, a Borders Books, and a Majestic Movie Theater. In 160 years, Silver Spring had gone from rural retreat for the Washington elite to diverse 21st century suburb of the nation's capital. Through prosperity and decay, the community stayed true to its character and preserved some of the most important landmarks from its history. The best of Silver Spring's architectural past and cultural past has been blended very effectively with Silver Spring's present and future. For a healthy community, there has to be kind of a base. There has to be an old, a how we did things, a, a memory, a history of what the world was like. It's never going to be the sleepy old Silver Spring it was of the 40s or the 50s, never. It's going to be a new kind of Silver Spring, that, but it has the old character of Silver Spring. That's important to keep that spirit going. As the 21st century began, Silver Spring was mindful of its past, but looking forward to the future. I think it's nice to see a change, modernization, people being on the streets again, I think. I think it's a plus. We have the opportunity to recapture what we had before. The sense of community, the sense of interrelationship and interacting. People coming here to meet, to shop, to dine and, and appreciate and love their community. I think we have combined the best of Silver Springs past with Silver Springs future.
funding for Silver Spring Story of an American Suburb was provided by the Arts and Humanities Council of Montgomery County, the Montgomery County Historic Preservation Commission, the Maryland State Arts Council, Whole Foods Market, devoted to supporting organics and natural foods, the Silver Spring Women's Club, part of the community for more than 60 years, and Silver Spring Studios, delivering turnkey film and video production services, and by contributions from viewers like you.